I would like to invite uh, Chancellor Rodriguez to address the faculty about these uh, professional considerations, what it means to be a community college professor. So please, a nice hand of applause for <laughs> Chancellor Rodriguez. Thank you. Do I need the microphone? Yeah. I do. <laughs> we want to start this to everybody. It's great to be here, Mission College. And I was sharing as, as I drove up here, it started off beautifully because I had no traffic from downtown. When's the last time you said that? <laughs> I discovered uh, Highway 2 and off I went through Eagle Rock and by myself I said, am I going the right way? I started to panic. <laughs> then I hit the 210 and came west and got here actually very, very smoothly. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you for the incredible lunch. I've come to Mission College before and there's a certain spirit here, a can-do attitude that is here, a professional ethic that is here. And I can't tell you how proud I was to turn that corner after driving through the neighborhood and just, oh, okay, yeah, here it is, coming up Eldridge, no, coming up Hubbard, right? And they're turning on Eldridge. As soon as you turn that corner, I don't know if you get the same impact that I get, but you turn that corner and you see this campus, this stands, this campus where we work, where you work every single day, is a powerful testament to persistence, determination. This is our city of hope right here. I turned that corner and said, wow, it just hit me. The sense of pride, what it means to a student who is walking onto the campus for the first time, first time college goer, first time college graduate potential, a person who seeks something different from their life and then turns that corner and walks onto this campus. I believe firmly that campuses need to be statements. Statements of opportunity, statements of success, statements that you're welcomed here. And I feel that here. It's gonna look a whole lot better when we get that building done. Do you agree? <laughs> and we will. The president, the district, we will. We, <laughs> when I've been throughout your campus, I've taken a wonderful tour. I've been to the uh, other southern, south campus. Is that what you call it? East. east campus. See, I'm norteado right now. I'm not sure if I'm east or west. The south campus, or east campus, excuse me, it's beautiful. It's a statement. So I wanted to at least share that initial piece because of, and, and, and really thank Louise and and the guild for this opportunity to, to reflect. You know, when I've taught in, the, in my courses, in the graduate courses, no matter what course it is, and I've had the benefit of teaching several, dis, uh, within the discipline of education, several courses, every course I build in a component of being a reflective practitioner. A reflective practitioner. So when I heard this opportunity that Louise presented for, for some professional reflection on behalf of the Guild, I said, this is perfect. And I commend you for carving out time. Because so much of our professional development time is on how. How to get something done. How to negotiate something. How to propel something. How to initiate. How to complete. How to assess. How to measure. But the professional reflection is the piece right before that. And right before that is the question of why? Why? Why do this? Why does it matter? Who cares? Who benefits? So in the brief time I have with you today, I'm going to try to expand on that notion of why. Of why we do this sort of work. And to remind us and to reflect upon why we chose this incredible and noble profession. There is no other activity that allows you to intercede and to intervene on a person's life that has a profound impact that lasts that person, not just that person, but that person's family for generations. There is no other intervention as powerful as education. There is none. So we're all in this very noble profession. 
So what I've done here is I, I want to reflect on a couple of things and I got a, a handout that I'll, that I prepared for Project Match. Remember Project Match? Did you participate in Project Match? Wonderful. Wow. Hey. I went to visit with them. I'll just digress a second here. This summer, 50, 60 very eager members of the academic community who want to be part of the LACCD family. They get mentored throughout the academic year. The goal is to acclimate them into the community college culture, into the LACCD uh, family, if you will, and to uh, embrace their interests as educators and ultimately to prepare them for strong, um, uh, strong con uh, contention for full-time faculty positions, librarians, counselors, and uh, disciplined faculty. This group was wonderful. So they, I was asked to talk to them. And at the end of, of their multi-week activity uh, throughout the summer, so I put together a little handout for them that I thought would be useful uh, for us to talk about today. But before I do that, let me just uh, share a little story about the power of, of intervention. And, and the story revolves around what Louise mentioned earlier, that the impact we have on others may be delayed. We don't always see it as instructors or counselors right away. Sometimes that feedback is immediate, but other times it's much more delayed. And the story goes, this is over 30 years ago. And I found myself as a civil engineering major at the University of California and going through I love science, I love math, I love the opportunity to think about bridges and construction and those sorts of things and stress strain, how things work. Uh, growing up in San Francisco, I was enamored by the Bay Bridge. I just would, we would catch the bus, literally, and just stand underneath it and just say, wow. It was just, you know, it was bigger than life and it was just this functional. All the attention was on the Golden Gate to our left over here. Pretty bridge, but this Bay Bridge with all its structure that connected the East Bay, that connected essentially Highway 80 to the East Coast, was, was, just, was just a real powerful functional bridge. So I thought because of that, you know, I was easily inspired obviously, uh, I said this might be something I could do. Well, in that trajectory of wanting to become an engineer, I started to tutor, I was part of a student club, an organization that tutored young people out in the communities, either either in um, the rural parts of, of Northern California or the city parts, not far from the university. So I had the opportunity to be an algebra tutor. I, yeah, I did this, it was fine, I enjoyed math. So I started working with students, and in particular this young man, and when he first started, he, he wasn't grasping the concept, he wasn't solving for X. Remember that? What's X? What's this, what's X? We're solving for X. Any math professors here? All right, solving for X, right, important. So I started to break it down with, you know, and give them some concrete examples. And one of the things that I discovered was that if you make learning relevant, it sticks, it absorbs, and people learn. You make it relevant. So I gave examples about him picking up his date, right? If he was driving really slow in his low rider car, at a certain amount of hours, how long it would take him to get his date. If he was in the country farther away and he had a hot rod, how long it would take him to get in. He said, yeah, okay, oh, oh, it was a real example. <laughs> he needed to figure this out as a junior high schooler, right? So, I mean, it was silly, but the point was, it started to bring relevance. The point of this is, I started to work with him and work with him and work with him. I was, he routinely saw me on Thursday afternoons. I was there, I did not miss, I, I was there other schools other days, but Thursdays I was at this particular junior high middle school. And after he started to improve his scores and I worked with him throughout the semester, and near the end he came and he was all done with his homework, so we were going through, I said, oh, we're all done, I guess we're, we're done here. And he said, no, I just want to sit and talk with you. It was no longer about the content. It was no longer about the teaching and tutoring. It was about the rapport that we had established. It was about the fact that I never lost hope in this young man. I didn't know him. That I believed in this young man. I leaned forward when I spoke to him. 
He commanded the respect that he deserved as a young man, coming from a poor rural family. I just thought that was a way to treat people. And that's when I discovered the power of intervention in a very visceral way. I believed that he could learn. And I wanted him to learn. And he demonstrated to himself that he could learn. That's when, literally, the following semester, the following semester, as I, and this was the, um, I, then I started to work in student outreach and recruitment. The following semester, I said, I will no longer be a civil engineer. I want to do something else in education. It, it changed my trajectory completely. And here I stand today. So it's a simple story of intervention of the power of community, the power of belief that I believe we all have when we interface with students. If you believe that they can learn, students will rise to that occasion. Provide them the tools so that they can learn. Make it relevant, students will surprise us. So I, I start with that because I, I, um, it was such a, a fundamental and instructive experience for me that it wasn't what I was saying necessarily, it was how I was engaged upon my work. The fact that I cared. The fact that I wanted him to succeed. And then when he was in front of me, nothing else was on my mind. He was the only student in the planet. And that's how he felt. Imagine if our students had that experience. For some of our students who come to Mission College, this place is the only part of their life that is normal, that is consistent, that is non-judgmental, that is a place where they can feel safe and nurtured and respected. They're here. And maybe it's your classroom where they get that. The only place, perhaps, where they get that feeling of safety and security and respect and tolerance, those sorts of things like that. So understanding where our students come from, the predicaments that they find themselves in, and your opportunity to provide a consistent voice matters. Beyond the teaching discipline, you, know, you teach students to be good citizens, you teach students to interact, you teach students to engage and ultimately to lead in whatever profession they're doing, beyond the discipline. And what students are doing, and the communications experts in this room will tell you, that students, the communication is 80% nonverbal. Nonverbal. They will infer whether you care, whether you're prepared, whether you're interested, whether you're engaged on how you carry about your work. The content's important, clearly. You're well prepared there. But they will infer excellence on how you carry, about, how you carry yourself. And, it's, and I've learned in the classroom, I did small, I, I was conscientious, and I was learning this from other maestros, master teachers, to showing up early, to be prepared, to communicate with students, to you know, interact, to stay a little while after, just those little things that signal that, that, uh, that, that we care and that they matter. So I share that because students will look at how you facilitate a discussion in the classroom, how you interact, how you don't always call on the people raising their hand, but try to fold others in to the conversation, how you hold them accountable to the norms and rules of whatever you set up in your classroom, and how you apply those consistently your preparedness for the lectures. In other words, do you stay to your course syllabus? Or if you get behind a little bit, you, you, know, you know, how you catch up and how you accelerate? Those sorts of things. They're inferring, they're negotiating, you're, you're demonstrating to them life skills. And whether you know this or not, to so many of our students, you're the first positive role model or mentor that they may come across. The first ones. And it's a powerful responsibility associated with that. Again, consistency, non-judgmental, those sorts of things. And I wrote here, you might be the first persons that they've seen as responsible adults. It sounds well, trivial, but for some of our students, in fact, you are. They will look at how you facilitate, how you collaborate, how you problem solve, and infer 
that that's how you do it. So it's beyond the content discipline that you're about. And there's one thing that is universally accepted and universally recognized, and that's the notion of respect. A person knows whether they're afforded respect or not, and courtesy, and dignity. Sometimes when students do not feel respected, they won't come back. It doesn't matter where your credentials come from or how, you know, how long we've been doing this profession. If they don't feel like they're afforded respect, they'll tend to leave. So a few things to think about. So focusing on your affect is absolutely key. I've hit on this point, but I, and I know this is hard to do sometimes, but I have found that when you articulate persistent optimism, it works. When you articulate a better future and demonstrate that, that through education, that anything is possible, it works. When you, edit, uh, you know, extend the notion of can and will do into your vernacular, into your behavior, they feed upon that. And they start emulating that. And the beauty of the LACCD college system and at Mission College in particular is that the students who are working here, interacting with other students, studying with other students here, the population is going to be very much like the communities that they're going to be working in. The notion of plurality, diversity, and pluralism, excuse me, is here. When we think about a general education, you know, we need to expand that definition a little bit to go beyond just race and ethnicity, but to include income and ability status and LGBTQ status, those sorts of other characteristics, whether they're documented, whether they're dreamers, in a much more inclusive way. Because if we allow our students to go through our educational system and they're not prepared for the diverse defined very broadly world that they will inherit, we will have done them a disservice. And I view it as education irresponsible if we don't extend opportunities for students to interact. So, this, so it's, a, it's a powerful responsibility that we have as educators uh, to intervene. Now, let me share something that I described earlier in the minutes that I have left. I only made 25 of these, so I'll send the, the copy to, to Luis. I won't go over each one of these, but these were the ideas that I shared with the Project Match people. So, ideas. And these were uh, ideas for aspiring community college faculty. You're already here. So understand how this was framed initially for them. But I wanted to point out Three things on this sheet here. Just 10 ideas. They're simple ideas, things that won't shock you. But I want to underscore three of them. One of them is the first one. And the point of, I think, the conversation today. Reflect on why you, we, were called to this noble profession. This is a calling. This is an avocation. Make no mistake. We don't stumble upon this role. This is something concerted, intentional. Whether it's going back to your personal statement from graduate school, whether it's the, I know every day I ask for strength and humility. Every single day, I have to remind myself. Every single day, every single day. And to, be, to try to be wise and patient. I have to. That's my own personal prayer. Each of us has something like that. The, the self-talk that occurs amongst educators when we're tasked with working in the most under-resourced system of higher education, the two-year system. Working with the students who are the least uh, capable of in terms of resources, the poorest students. Working with students who are their most underprepared. Those three factors most folks would run away from. Yet, we don't. We run in. 
So why were you called? Why were we called to this profession? I think it's fruitful to remind ourselves of that and to be very proud that there's a community of educators at Mission College and throughout LACCD with our profound and ethical commitment to the education of everyone. And as I have traveled throughout the nine colleges and have other folks have asked me, gosh, you know, Francisco, how is this? What's LACCD like? You should see the myth of LACCD in California. The myth of what people, it's on, you know, it's so big. Who are you guys, right? It, there, there is a, there is a, there's an urban myth. How's it going? And I say, you know what? It's going well. And I tell them, I've never seen the commitment of faculty and staff and administrators like those at LACCD. The commitment that we have is profound. It is powerful, and I can't tell you how proud I am. When I go in a couple weeks to the uh, November uh, league meeting, it's our, we meet twice a year, all the presidents get together, it's the big statewide conference. It's where everyone walks around like peacocks. <laughs> you know, who, who, they're <laughs> who they're representing and this and that. That day, over those two days that I'll be there, I'm gonna be two, three, four inches taller because I'll have the badge of LACCD. I will. I'm already a proud guy, but that is going to be especially proud to represent each one of you and this district. And to, and to start to shape a narrative about urban education, about LACCD, that perhaps uh, uh, is different from what people can imagine. So reflect on why we were called to this profession. It's the toughest job. It is. If it's tough, if it's messy, if it feels disorganized, if it feels a little bit, like so, sometimes we're, we're, we're off the rails, that's normal, I would contend. Because of those conditions of being under-resourced, working with underprepared students. Okay, that's why. It's normal. If it's easy, something's wrong. Does anybody agree with that? Okay, <laughs> all right. All right, so that part is important too. So that's, so that's one of the things I want to highlight there. Second one I want to highlight is tell your story. Each one of us in this room and throughout the district has a narrative, a story to tell. Each of us comes from somewhere where a person was not educated. It could be a recent generation, it could be a past generation. I say embrace that story. Because if you start to unpackage that story of that person in your family, you will uncover and discover amazing resilience, amazing persistence, amazing stick to itness, amazing strength from those folks who had very little. Imagine trying to function in a society without being able to read and to write. That's tough work. Yet all of us have that person in our family, or persons. I have generations of poverty and isolation in my family background that I draw on today, every single day, for strength. All of us has that. Reflect back on that journey that they took so that we could be here at beautiful, powerful Mission College, enjoying the fruits of our students in an academic community, talking about how we can do more for others. What a privilege and what a transformation. They could have only imagined that one day we would be here. And it was, they didn't know, but they wanted the future generations to be better off than the ones before. And here we are. So now, what is our responsibility for the next generation? That's the responsibility of an educator. So find strength in that. I keep a picture of my grandmother handy. Grew up in a mud hut, you know, but yet she toiled the soil, everything she touched grew. Talk about culinary arts. Man, if Bobby Flay would have showed up in her kitchen, <laughs> she would have thrown him down and sent him home packing crying because she could make something out of nothing. 
You know, that's culinary arts, right? That's good. <laughs> Do more with less. Right? We would have sent him home crying, Bobby Flay. So tell your story. Be proud of your story. I mean, disclose what you're comfortable with. If the students know that at one point in your family's trajectory, you were just like them, searching, looking for a better path, or someone in your family was learning to read, someone in your family was learning to learn English, like I did, someone in your family was learning to become a citizen of this country, someone in your family came across on the ocean or across the border, tell them. Those are powerful narratives that are uniquely, richly your own, that I think could, is educationally purposeful. We all have a story. We all should be proud of it. Okay, it's, it's because of the strength. That's why, you know, any immigrant story is a powerful one for me because it's resilience, it's strength, it's against all odds. It is, you know, not being resourceful. Sounds to me like a community college professor to me. In every way, in every way. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention and then I'll see if you have any questions and Louise can do this at any point. I know. She, no, she, she can say, ya cortale, ya es mucho. No, 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 just one more. Just one more. And, uh, how about balance? Yeah, how about balance? That's important. You know, yeah, and it, you know, this is year 30 for me in public higher education. It's wonderful. And, and I would say, uh, candidly, that it took me 15 years to find balance. The first 15, I was just, I was unbalanced. I was, the, then I discovered, then I discovered that the work never ends. <laughs> it took me only 15 years to figure that out. The work never ends. It never ends. So I had to put parameters. And fortunately, I had a wife I do have a wife who's a mental health expert. <laughs> That's a true story. Some of you know her. LCSW, I was her first maybe patient and continuing patient. Counselee about balance, about, about, about really understanding what's important. And then once I had children, I said, oh, okay. You know, being not you know, I learned a couple of things. Don't just be visible, be present. And as a young father, I was visible, but I wasn't present. Yeah. Understand the distinction there? I showed up to things, but my mind was solving problems. I was there at the ball game, but I was, you know, a good thing. When it, and so now you notice, I don't look at my phone. In meetings, I refuse to have people looking at their phones. It is rude and disrespectful. If there's a fire, someone will yell fire. <laughs> right? It's true. I just, I... Be present. Be present. Whether it's a meeting, an activity, whatever that thing is, focus on what that thing is. So balance. And I found that like today at 4.59, I'm leaving the office because I'm watching every pitch of the World Series <laughs> with the Giants, my favorite team. I am. I'm sorry that the place is not burning down. Adios. I am. <laughs> So don't call me at 501, I won't be there. So it's, a, it's about priorities, it's about um, you know, not letting the schedule dictate, but you dictate your schedule, about carving out time for, for whatever it is that relaxes you, uh, whatever it is, whether it's taking a walk, talking to someone, reading, listening to music, get away from this stuff. It doesn't end. I know that this is the middle of the semester, you've got tons of stuff going on. But I have found just an afternoon sometimes away from it allows me to come back fresh, allows me to come back renewed, allows me to come back with a different attitude, frankly. Sometimes a full day you know, on the weekend, and I'll come back to it the following day. Because does, it doesn't end. The work doesn't. So you have to put parameters on it. 
And you know, the, some of you have some very good strategies on how to keep things in order. Uh, for me, after, uh, and uh, Joanne will, will attest to this, I don't send weekend or I try not to send evening uh, emails. Even, because then people feel like they have to respond, that they're always on. Now during the day, I'm a beast. I'll send it anytime, any place, as much as I can when I'm at my desk. I will. It, <laughs> there's a, ask, ask your president. It rains. But evenings and weekends, unless there's something urgent, I won't do that. That's your time. You know, so, so little things like that, I, you know, I'm not an expert at it, but, but I will say that the, the stress relief is important. And understanding those triggers for stress are important. Michael? <laughs> as long as you're responsive during the normal working hours, doubly responsive. No, that's funny. That's good. No, it, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, you, uh, people who are responding at 10, 12, midnight, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I just, you know, sometimes you need to do that. I, I get that. The work never ends. But other times, just a little bit of departure is important towards the proximity of attachment. Uh, so, but it took me a while to figure that out. And in this, this job, are you kidding me? There are so many moving parts here that I could be, I'm, I'm at the office a lot, you know, weekends a lot, you know, evenings a lot. But when I'm away, I'm away. Um, and uh, it's important. And part of it is that, you know, my wife's 400 miles north. We call it the just enough marriage. <laughs> it's just enough. Sunday night, Edema says, that's enough. And I'll find <laughs> Too much disclosure here, right? No, but, and it, we, the last five years have been like this, uh, and uh, it won't always be like this, but it, it works for now. So when I'm here, I'm here. When I'm up north or she's down here, we're, 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 we're focused on other things. But balance is important. Uh, you know yourself best. You know your triggers. Do those things that bring you joy. At least, and do them routinely. Whatever that is. With music or exercise, whatever it is, because the work will always be there for you. And then last thing, I'll just conclude with this, and then see if you have any questions. And Louisa, I apologize for going longer. This, you know, I can't tell you how much I enjoy this. Speaking to, to my peers. It's a unique opportunity for all of us. Well, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Be in it for the long run. I know you are. And I respect those faculty who have been here 20, 30, 40 years. I met someone from Pierce College, 50, no, Valley College, 50 years in political science. 50, and she looked like she had more energy than anyone in the room. I said, wow. <laughs> wow. So be in it for the long run. The changes, the perils that uh, were discussed earlier, this performance-based funding, that's a peril. It is. We have to shift that narrative in such a way that we, we appre appreciate and support accountability, but it's not all numerical. It's not all metric based. It, all these things can't be measured. How do you measure hope? How do you measure someone's belief? How do you measure someone's resilience and persistence? All those characteristics that we know make for a successful person. How do you measure the fact, uh, you know, when a person fails at something, that they get right back up and get back on and start walking forward? There's not, how do you measure that? So I agree, we have to be at the center of that conversation so that someone who only cares about the bottom line does not hijack this issue. Right. And put us down a pathway that only the numbers matter because the experience matters too. We have to redefine what success is and broaden the definition of success. Those students who take our courses and go from one semester to the next are successful with the passing grade. Those students who learn concepts that allow them to be better citizens, better engaged, are successful. But we have to reclaim the definition of success and say it comes in many forms, including graduation and certificates and degrees, including those, of course. Of course, because that's how we vie for more support. When we show that the, the investment the public is making is actually making a demonstrable difference. That's how, that gives us fodder. The state capital gives us fodder at the federal government for more support. 
So I would encourage us to be at the center of that conversation. And that, in my view, has to be a faculty-driven conversation. And I would invite us to be part of that uh, conversation as well. So I can't tell you uh, what a joy this is always to, to visit uh, with peers and colleagues from around the district. You know, this is, I, I think I have the best job because I get to visit the 10 jewels of this district. They're all jewels. They're all unique, important, engaging, but the commonality of the locations is that we're all educators. That we all are part of this journey, if you will, and part of this profession that intervenes, that supports, that says, let me assist, that signals success to each person that we come in contact with. So it's a joy uh, to serve as your chancellor. Uh, November 1 begins month 6. Forget that though. 10 board meetings completed. I count by board meetings. <laughs> I know. That's a, that's a joke. No one tell the board. Actually, they've been wonderful. Incredibly supportive. Incredibly supportive. Incredibly supportive. And what a joy it is to work with them. Uh, and, and to support them in their task as, as, the, as the board of the district and then filtering their support uh, to each one of you and, and to each of our colleges. So I appreciate uh, your, your attention and I'm happy to respond to anything that might have triggered uh, a response or any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we, we're not used to that, and we can get used to that. So well, so could I. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have. I have. It's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you, Joanne. I, I, this has been great. Yeah, no, I have, I have. This is, there's no bigger job than this one, no more important job than this one. I have no other ambition. This is it. This is big enough. This is enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's challenging because we all want to be challenged in our careers, and we all want to make, uh, we all want to have impact. And there's no larger academic stage than LACCD to do that. Yeah, so I find it a privilege to, to work with and for you. I do. I find it as an absolute privilege and a, and a responsibility and obligation in that capacity. So yes, I have. You know, I have a little place downtown. I'm walking with my canvas bag everywhere, you know, <laughs> avoiding the dogs and avoiding... Uh, downtown is... A, I, I don't know if we'll be there for a long time. But uh, it's kind of cool right now. I'm catching the, uh, the metro to different places. And you know, it's, uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed the experience so far. Not being on the freeways is kind of cool, at least for a couple days a week. So I've, en I've enjoyed it very much. And you're all invited to the district office and to the ninth floor. You heard that the air is thinner up there? It is. <laughs> it's nine stories up. But no, I, I invite you to come over any anytime. You're, you're welcome there. Other questions or thoughts? Reactions. Well, I think the silence in the room was really because so much of what you said was resonating with what we think. Yeah. Good, good. And it's just comforting to know good. that good. our district is on the same wavelength as we're on. I appreciate that. You know, I know this is a very, uh, 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 it's a large task. The chancellor of this district is, is uh, tasked with quite a, quite a you know, major set of responsibilities. But I hope I never lose sight, and I hope that you hold me accountable to the notion that I'm an educator first. And I see things through an educational lens first. And I, I will try to make my judgments prudence based on that educational lens first. Okay, thank you. Yes? Great question, and it's, uh, it's a work in progress. The question is, what impact will adult education have on uh, this region? And the one word answer is profound. Here's why. There is, for the first time, a real opportunity to reposition community colleges 
and adult education in California. Some community colleges, such as ours, are looking very carefully at absorbing the responsibility with funding for parts of adult education. In its heyday, LAUSD, our biggest partner, served 800,000 adults. 800,000 adults learning English, learning uh, some uh, technical skills, CTE, citizenship classes, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest of those parts of those areas was ESL, literacy. So what we have to figure out is what the appropriate academic space is for us to do and how we'll be funded for it, where the academic handoff is, is between adult education curriculum and community college curriculum, where the gaps are, et cetera. So it's a Herculean task. And there's been a group of folks, anybody in here involved with that discussion? Uh, there's a, okay, pardon me? At this college. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but I mean like the discussion with the four other school districts. Because we received a regional planning grant in which we will submit an initial report in November and then another report later in the academic year about how this relationship might work. In our particular case with LAUSD, Montebello, Culver City, and Burbank, thank you. How we might do that. And there's finally an opening that is not territorial, where people are saying, well, what might be the strengths of a relationship here, a functional relationship? The way I see it to, to get to where my thinking is, if we do this well, this could be an academic pipe, uh, sort of on-ramp and off-ramp for students for the district if we do this well and if we're funded for this. No one's interested in an unfunded mandate once again. No one's interested in that. So we have to be mindful of that responsibility. It's, oh yeah, we'll take it on. Well, what does that mean? We have to be mindful there's a whole population of educators that work for those school districts who are just as dedicated as we are, who are also educators. So what's the appropriate bureaucratic framework by which, or administrative framework, by which we could all function and play to the strengths that each of, each of us has. So we're discovering each other's uh, strengths, we're discovering each other's limitations, and trying to find that sweet spot, and then making a case to the state government uh, to, to support adult education. Right now, in the, in the, there's a suggestion that if we do our work well and submit these proposals as we intend to do by the end of November, that there'll be some kind of budget allocation for adult education and community colleges in the January uh, initial budget. So that's the rush towards that effort there. But for us, it, it could mean quite a bit. It could mean quite a bit in terms of, uh, again, on and off ramps. Uh, I don't like to use the word pipeline too much because it means only one way in and one way out. And you know, we know with our students, that's not the case. They get on, they get off. They get on, they get off. They get on, they get off, right? I remind them, this is a two-year college. If I see you five years later, we got a problem, I tell them. It's a two-year college. By the way, it takes our students four years to get a two-year degree. That, that we, we know that statistically. They go part-time. 70% 70, 70 of our students are part-time. So one is a curricular discussion. One is um, that is the academic handoff. Another one is the administrative discussion, the governance discussion, who controls what. And then, of course, the, the big one is the funding discussion. So I suspect that we will support what we can uh, uh, do and do well and be funded at it. The governor, way back two years ago, uh, proposed it at 30 cents on the dollar. That wasn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't gonna work. By the way, adult education is now well under 200,000 students at LAUSD. They've lost students. Not lost the need. We work in one of the most um, needy, ed educational needy um, environments in, in the country. The, the literacy level is lower than, than most parts of California. So, there's, so they say that, oh, oh, everyone just became literate. That's not the case. So when those two, three, four hundred thousand students, like, like uh, the students that we lost in our district, aren't coming to us, it's not because we've met their need. The, the participation rate, we could increase that per 1,000 adults. We have opportunity to do that. And we've told the state government who funded us at a higher rate of growth, that we're, that we're gonna fill our classrooms. So for those of you who have tight classrooms and are bursting at the seams, thank you for that, because you're helping to carry us right now in the district. 
Not all, not all colleges in the district are growing, as you know. So the colleges that can, and this college is one of them, and you're doing yeoman's work, uh, accepting as many students as, as the fire marshal will allow. <laughs> all right. Other thoughts? So it, it's a too short an answer. It's a huge, this, this is historic. If we do this well, this could be, you know, the intervention for adult literacy and education in the LA region for a very long time if we do this well. Or else we're going to be cousins working with each other. And we've tried that already for, since the late 60s. So I like to try something else, at least parts of it. And ESL, we're the ESL people. We do this very well. We're really good at that. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a living example of ESL. But in those days, it was sink or swim. We didn't know en enough about the brain. And yeah, it was sink or swim. So it was Dalegas, young man. It was, it was, it was tough. All right. Any, any others? Well, you've got other business. Uh, thank you. This, is, this has been uh, the highlight of my day. It really has. So thank you so very much. <laughs>